One of the most important ideas in calculus is the idea of a limit. And before we actually define a limit, I want to look at a few applications. And the first one has to do with average velocity. And so when we look at example one, this is a problem that you should already know how to do. And it's basically, we've got a car passes mile post 100 at 12 p.m. and then passes mile post 130 at 12.30 p.m. What is the car's average velocity during the half hour? And let's find that in miles per hour. And so we use the formula for average velocity, which is your change in position over the elapsed time or the change in time. And so quite often we use s to name our position function. And so if we had a function, it would be s of t sub 1 minus s of t sub 0, your position after time minus your initial position, and then divided by the change in time. And so for us, the change in position is basically the 130 minus the 100 divided by the change in time. And the change in time is 30 minutes. So what we end up having is 30 miles in 30 minutes, or one mile per minute. And if we want to change that to miles per hour, we would just multiply by, we would need how many minutes there are in one hour. And there are 60 minutes in one hour, and so this is a, a conversion factor, we're canceling the minutes, and we end up with 60 miles per hour. All right, so the next problem involves an average velocity problem where we actually have a function to work with. And so we've got a rock is launched vertically upward from the ground with a speed of 96 feet per second. Neglecting air resistance, a well-known formula from physics states that the position of the rock after t seconds is given by the function s of t equals negative 16 t squared plus 96 t. The position s is measured in feet. So before we actually try and find the average velocity of this, I'd like to show you how to use a, a parametric equation. And I don't want you to stress too much about the idea of a parametric equation. It's basically a way to define both your x and your y in terms of some other parameter. Basically, we want to determine x and y in terms of time. And this helps us show motion on a graphing calculator. So if we scroll to the next page, this is, you can refer back to this after. These are the window settings, but I'm going to go through this with you. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go into mode. And yours most likely, your screen most likely looks like mine, and you have normal, float, uh, radians, um, and here we have function. What we want to do, we don't want to be in function mode, we want to be in parametric mode. So we highlight, we arrow down and highlight. Connected can stay. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to arrow over and hit simultaneous, because I'm going to actually graph two equations and I want them to graph at the same time. If you leave it on sequential, you can graph more than one equation, but it will graph one equation and then the next. So once you've got this set up, we want to go in and set up the window. So we'll hit window, and you'll see here that we have t, so both x and y are going to be in terms of time, and so we want to set up our range of values for t. So our minimum t will be zero, I'm going to arrow down. Our maximum t will be 7. t step is really how often the calculator will calculate values. If you make your t step too small, it will take forever uh, to graph and see the motion occur. If you make it too big, it'll happen too fast. So for this one, I played around with it, and I thought 0.25 worked well. If when you graph this, you feel like it's going too slow, you can up it to uh, 0.5. And you can see what happens when you change it to 0.1. x min for this problem is going to be negative 3. 
x max is going to be 7, and these are just values that I chose after playing around for this um, you know, for a while. The scale is 1. Arrowing down, we want our y min to be negative 20. Our y max to be 150. And our scale, 10 is fine. Um, I think that's all we need for this. Now we need to enter our equations in, and so I'm going to go to y equals, and you notice this looks different if you've used a graphing calculator in the past. This doesn't just have a bunch of y values, it has an x value and a y value. And what's happening here is that the x coordinate is, being, is a function of time, and the y coordinate is also a function of time. So what we're going to do is we're going to let the x, x1 equal just negative 1. which is really just a vertical line. y1 is going to be our actual function, negative 16 hit x and what will happen is t will show up because we're in parametric mode t squared plus 96t and if I were to graph that, and maybe I'll show you right now by graphing that if I just take graph right now, you can see it just shows a vertical line. I really didn't catch any motion at all. I'm going to go back into y equals, and I'm going to arrow over to the left of x sub 1, and I'm going to hit enter. You see you get a thick line. If I hit enter again, I get a line with a circle again, and I just get a circle. I'm going to hit graph again, and you can now see the motion of the rock. It's being thrown vertically up and there's no wind, so it just falls straight down again. But that's just the actual motion of the rock. What I'd like to see is, I'd like to see the height as a function of time. And so we're going to go back into y equals and we're going to graph another equation we're going to let our x value just equal t and now our y value is still going to equal the function negative 16 t squared plus 96 t and we're going to hit graph again now that happened really quickly so I'm going to go in and change my t-step. I'm going to go into window and I'm going to change my t-step to 0.01. Now I changed my t-step to 0.01 and you can see here how this is kind of dragging on a bit. It's calculating too many values it's going to take forever. So I'm going to go back and change that to 0.1. So I'm in a second quit. Sometimes it does not quit uh, easily and so I actually shut the calculator off when it's in the middle of one of these. It, it can freeze, especially when it's calculating lots of values. Changing the t-step to 0.1 has made a difference, so I'm going to hit graph and if you hit enter you can pause the graph and we can just talk about what's happening right now the the rock is on its way up and if you look over here this is our position versus time graph as time moves on the position of the rock is increasing I hit enter to keep graphing the rock is climbing vertically but as time moves on you can see this is going to be the shape of a parabola looks right there like we've hit that maximum height and now the rock is falling to the ground okay. I'm going to hit pause again so this ball right here the x equals negative 1 is just a vertical line and it allows us to show the motion of that rock just up and down on a vertical line x equals negative 1 that second function is the position function s in terms of t so I'll hit enter one more time and complete the graph.
Now if I want to graph this again, if I hit graph, you can't see the motion. So unfortunately what you have to do is you go back into y equals. If you just arrow over and hit enter, you shut off the equations. You hit enter again and you turn them on. And so it'll allow us to hit graph again. And again you can see the motion. You can pause it by hitting enter and start it up again. So I just wanted you to get an idea of, the, I think sometimes people just see a position function and think that's the actual path of the ball or the rock. But in this case the rock was moving in a vertical motion just up and down and then the position function just shows how the height or the distance above the ground changes with respect to time. It increases until the ball hits its maximum height and then the position function decreases as the ball falls to the ground. Okay, we'll actually work with this problem in the next video.